real rates are still very negative, which, you know, and that's negative interest rates are rocket fuel for gold and silver. I mean, that's that's why these buyers in the Eastern Hemisphere are buying hand over fist. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics and quite excited to be joined by my old friend, Dave Kranzler, who's been doing his bi-monthly silver report. No, uh, bi-weekly. Bi-weekly, which I, I guess you explained it every week, so I should have it by now, but twice a month silver report. And <laughs> fortunately, we decided to do a call together today. So We'll be digging into gold and silver and a lot of the other interesting developments that are going on in our expansionary currency world. But Dave, it's great to see you again in front of your massive giant silver panda, which the, the bears look happy. One's got his fist pump up there in the background watching the debasement of the currencies. And now on the other side, he looks like he's given a big fist pump in, in his excitement. So... How's They're everything getting going? ready to go skiing? See, see the see the little yellow skis down there in the in the corner. Well, I know how pandas do love to ski. Obviously, you're down in Denver in ski territory. So, before we start <laughs> off, how are you doing today, my friend? Good to see you again. Likewise, great to see you. You're looking good. Well, Mexico's we're, treating you well. Yeah, we're doing all right here, hanging out in Mexico and just taking it day by day, watching these. Markets which still have uh, some tough times in gold and silver. We're recording Wednesday, mm -hmm. October 19th. See gold right now at 1633. Silver at 1836, which we've seen some brief rallies, especially in silver uh, as well as gold. Although still with the Fed cranking away, we see a lot of hedge fund and CTA selling. And curious where you see things standing right now. Uh, it's been trapped in that 18 to 20 range in silver in particular. What do you see coming forward in an, in an environment where the Fed's continuing to hike, although we're seeing metal leave the exchanges and significant retail buying? So some conflicting factors there. Where do you see the whole situation right now? I mean, what we're what we're seeing going on with the price of gold and silver, prices of gold and silver, is a product of the paper derivative markets. It's you know the 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 price setting is is captive to the derivatives traders right now, and it has. I mean, it it has been for most of the time that I've been involved in this sector, going back to two thousand one. There. We do get some periods of reprieve, and that's usually when there's uh, all of a sudden, a, you know, a tightness in the in the supply of gold and silver that can be delivered to end buyers, and um, they have to let the price rise in order to slow down the demand. Right, and by the end buyers of physical being, you know, large entities in the Eastern Hemisphere. So, uh, you know, I, I mean. People in the audience have heard me say this probably enough times, but it's it's a it's a bifurcated market. It's it's the paper derivative side that operates in in London and New York, and then there's it's the physical side that operates in the Eastern Hemisphere and increasingly in the Middle East. So, and th those are the buyers who are benefiting from um, what is you know I guess I could just call it um, incorrect. Uh, price discovery mechanism of the paper market. So, I mean, you know, you can, I should probably do this at some point, but you can, you can, if you did a chart that showed the S and P 500 futures plotted against gold or silver futures, I'm sure the correlation in the, in the directional movement is, is somewhere north of 80%. So, you know, like last night, uh, stock futures started selling off and, you know, I don't have that chart up, but um, when I went to bed, the S&P index futures were up like 32 points. And when I woke up, they were down 20 points. So um, somewhere while I was sleeping, you know, stock, you know, stock futures started selling off. And that's when hedge funds sell their long positions and, and short stock futures. And they also short 
gold and silver futures. And that's what drives the price down. And part of that's in response to um, uh, the the um, rise in the dollar index, right? I mean, the dollar index is up 0.67%, which is a pretty large move. So uh, what I would like to throw out there, though, is that this, this and that, this narrative that you know gold is going lower. Well, first of all, it's it's paper gold. Um, you know, gold is going lower because central banks are hiking interest rates. Well, that's bullshit. I mean, Adam Hamilton did an exhaustive statistical study going back to the early seventies that shows when the Fed starts a rate hike cycle, that's when gold has its best periodic rates of return. And that you know that's that's fifty years of data right there. So um, it, it, this this doesn't have to do with the interest rate hikes. I mean, real rates are still very negative, which, you know, and that's negative interest rates are rocket fuel for gold and silver. I mean, that's that's why these buyers in the Eastern Hemisphere are buying hand over fist. So, um, you know, speaking of of the movement of physical gold from from west to east, which has been going on a long time, Bloomberg published an article i think it came out yesterday or the day before and it, you know it said right that one and it, it said uh it might have even come out earlier than that because gata sent it around yeah october 9th gata sent it around a while ago well it's just now making its way into zero hedge and um it it says many western investors particularly at the institutional level are dumping bullion well no bullion refers to physical gold and silver Western institutions don't own physical gold and silver. Western institutions own paper gold and silver in the form of COMEX futures or something like GLD or SLV. Those are derivative forms of gold and silver, and that's what they're selling, all right? And it's, it, they're not selling physical bullion. However, what is happening, and we've seen the data that shows this, is that the, the vaults in, in New York, and really they're Delaware vaults for the most part, and, and in London are being drained rather quickly. And that's gold and silver that's moving to the Eastern Hemisphere. And this article does reference, I think, um, the fact that India is, is buying a lot of silver right now. And, and China is buying a lot of everything that's physical and not just gold and silver. They're, they're converting their, their fiat dollars, their dollar reserves into, um, into physical goods, right? Which is certainly understandable given what's going on in the world, which we will dig into today. Although I might add a nice picture of your your gold collection here that they they found for the article. <laughs> um, I did notice there was an article yesterday that talked about Turkey and their gold buying. Also mentioned them having increased silver imports as well. And I think this was the part that I saw you disagree with on Twitter, um, because actually, let me take a step back. Here, Asian buying picks up when the prices are low, helping to put a floor. Although you disagreed with when the gold eventually rallies, much of it returns in the bank vaults beneath, between, beneath the streets of New York, London, and Zurich, which I don't think we've really seen. It just seems to be going east and staying there. Um, any thoughts on that? I, I mean, I would like them to show me their evidence <laughs> uh, that that's something that happens. So, yeah, the vaults the vaults were replenished in March and April of 2020 because there was almost there was almost delivery defaults back then, if you recall. So and now and now the, the vaults are being drained again. So, I mean, the, the, the entities that are actually buying this physical gold and silver in the eastern hemisphere and, you know, Turkey, Middle East. They're not going to send their bars back to Comex vaults in, in in Delaware or back to vaults in London. I mean that that's just a bullshit statement. It's just it's just bad reporting. It's it's lack of knowledge of facts. Well, which lot... it shouldn't surprise us. I mean that's what we get from the mainstream media. <clears throat> well, that that's why we got you on here, baby. We get 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 it from Dave Kranzler himself. Though uh, perhaps somewhat explaining that, there was an article from Jan Neuenhaus, who actually had the pleasure of meeting back in the Netherlands uh, almost a decade ago. But he mentions, for a million of people in Asia, gold still is the basic form of saving. 
In contrast to the West, where financialization started decades ago and gold has slowly been removed until a crisis emerges. In the West, people own little or no physical gold when they feel financially confident, but that's much different in the East. And it is interesting, even with interest rates going up, like you pointed out, still a negative real interest rate. We're, we're seeing that inflation is still high, obviously a lot of reason to believe it's higher than the CPI, but even taking the CPI numbers, even with those interest rate increases, you're still losing value there. And it seems like there's a much different view over in China and the Far East of how they're looking at it. I, I mean, the real buyers of physical gold and silver aren't, they don't care about interest rates. I mean, this, this, the, this article mentioned it, you know, you know, there's less incentive to hold to hold gold with with interest rates rising. Well, that's total BS. You don't hold gold to earn interest on it, or you don't hold gold because you can't earn any interest on a CD account at a bank. You hold gold as an insurance policy, right? And and that 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 side of of owning gold and silver is you can't measure the value of that, right? <laughs> I mean. What's the value of your homeowner's insurance if your car, if your house is getting incinerated, right? I, but I'll tell you this, when the house catches on fire, and if you don't have homeowner's insurance, no one's going to sell it to you. So um, this guy, Joseph Stephans or Stevens of Bloomberg, he's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just espousing the the nonsensical Western mainstream media narrative about gold and silver. And that's that's what that entire article is. And the only thing that's correct about it is that, one, the vaults are being drained in the West, Gresham's Law, right? And and two, that gold and silver is being moved to the Eastern Hemisphere buyers. That Okay? Other than that, that article's garbage. <laughs> Dave, once again, I feel like you're holding back and sugarcoating things. So come on, let's let's get your real views. Although... Perhaps we could update your analogy with the house and, and fire scenario in terms of how do you feel about gold and silver when even Janet Yellen, who once <laughs> said that we would not see another crisis, financial crisis in our lifetime, now worries over loss of adequate liquidity in treasuries. There were a couple of things that came out last week that were pretty shocking here. We're worried about a loss of adequate liquidity in the market. The balance sheet capacity of broker dealers to engage in treasury market making hasn't expanded much, while, of course, the overall supply of treasuries has climbed. That doesn't sound good. And then sure enough, on uh, the 14th, U.S. Treasury asked major banks if it should buy back bonds. I've been waiting all weekend to get your thoughts on this one, where the treasury is now going to buy back treasuries with treasuries. <laughs> so... Uh, I know they were talking about buying some of the less <laughs> liquid ones, yet still doesn't sound like an ideal scenario, especially that even Janet Yellen is finally expressing concern. We're worried about a loss of adequate liquidity in the market. Again, this is on the heels of what we've seen in the British bond market. So what are your thoughts on even Janet Yellen expressing some concern now? Man, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but first, is it just me? Or, I mean, real even real life photos of her make her look like a cartoon character. Yeah, I just, every time I see her, right I can't you, help Chris. but chuckle. <laughs> I just can't believe she was the, the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve at one point. <laughs> I've never heard an intelligent comment come out of her, her mouth. Um, yes, it is true that there's a uh, lack of liquidity in the treasury market, but it, it's it's a that issue is is the Fed's own doing. It's it, it, you know, it came about as a result of, you know, the, the massive amount of QE. And it, if you scroll up again, that there's that statement about um, market makers the, the other way. Yeah. Um, Balance sheet capacity of broker dealers to engage in treasuries market market making. Well, yeah, I mean that was part of the Graham Dodd Act. It it reduced the ability of banks to commit capital to the markets, and and but there is a reason for that because 
I mean, you, you know, going back to at least 2008, the, the market for U.S. government securities has been completely artificial, right? Interest rates have been pinned at, at zero or near zero. I mean, even out at the long end. And so you, you, you don't, I mean, the interest rates, that, that should be, that's basically your market clearing price for treasuries, right? But when the Fed's buying 50% of everything that's being issued by the treasury and using, and using printed money to do that, you don't have a real market. So um, now that the Fed has stopped printing money and is, you know, begrudgingly slightly reducing the size of its balance sheet, um, the Fed was was the liquidity in the Treasury market, and that's 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 not there anymore. So now the Treasury Yellen wants the Treasury to be the liquidity in the Treasury market. As you pointed out, what what the hell are they going to do? Issue more Treasuries to buy back Treasuries? I mean, this whole thing has just gone. It's so absurd. It's you know our our policymakers are nothing but a bunch of dogs chasing their own tails, and and everything has been so rigged and. With intervention and money printing, that yeah, of course, there's no liquidity in the treasury market. <clears throat> well, yeah, it doesn't seem like an ideal scenario. Although, but who the hell wants to buy? If you're a big, if you've got a lot of cash, you're a massive institution, and you've got a lot of cash that you're sitting on, you're not going to buy a ten-year treasury at 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 four percent when you know six months down the road there's a good chance it's going to be trading at six percent because. The way bond math works is when interest rates rise, the the value of your treasury bond goes down. So why would you why would you commit money to buying treasuries when you know it's a losing trade and it's a losing trade for the foreseeable future? So yeah, of course there's no liquidity in the market. The only people who are looking for treasuries are pe people who take those treasuries and 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 pledge them as collateral for OTC derivative trades or something like that, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, perhaps uh, not entirely unsurprising because it comes on the heels of what we've seen in England where we had the yield spike uh, and quantitative tightening put on hold as the Bank of England was buying bonds to settle things down there. Interesting that this week was when that bond buying supposedly stopped. Are you surprised that we've seen the yield come back under 4%, especially here? This came out uh, again on Wednesday, October 19th, that Bank of, Bank of England confirms bond sales will begin on November 1st. Are you expecting another spike back up here soon? It's certainly the yield has certainly dropped quite a bit, but wondering what you see there going forward. I, I mean, that's a good question. I don't know if I don't know if the the stabilization in the gilt market. Well, I mean, I guess you know the pensions are done selling; they don't have to sell anymore. So there, you know, there the there's not pressure on the bid side of the market to take on more paper, right? And the Bank of England, you know, fixed that problem. Which I mean, you know, again, it's just papering, papering over it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens if if the Bank of England starts bleeding those bonds back into the market. I mean, they said November first, right? Well, a lot can happen between now and November first that would cause the Bank of England to change its mind. So, and also to some extent, I would not be surprised if if uh, the other Brethren, central banks, the ECB and the Fed and maybe even the Bank of Japan are are helping behind the scenes, you know, keep the gilt market propped up. We don't, you know, the Fed has some some disclosure, but it's highly inadequate. And, it, you know, it's it's got swap lines set up with foreign central banks that that, you know, provide liquidity especially dollar liquidity to these to those banking systems when they need it and so you know again i who knows the fed could be in there you know helping prop up the the guilt market i you know there's just not a, there's missing pieces of information that we don't have um in order to really properly assess what's going on with the guilt market well we did see them sending money over to the swiss national bank so uh... yes 
interesting not buying bonds here in the U.S., but still sending money out there. And you know, again, to, to prove my point about the Fed helping, um, you know, prop up or help put out fires in the financial system in, in you know, around the world, or at least with our NATO allies, um, it, it's I mean, it's it's probably a ninety nine point five percent probability that the the dollars sent to the Bank of Switzerland were used to remedy a dollar shortfall at Credit Suisse, which basically if if the Swiss National Bank and the rest of the Western Central Bank stepped away from Credit Suisse, I think Credit Suisse would would um, would implode tomorrow. It is not an ideal scenario out there, that's for sure. And I think by, <laughs> you know, a lot of people are still wondering if there will be a Fed pivot. I mean, when you look at the Treasury talking about buying bonds, is that a de facto pivot in another form? Um, do not seem to be any easy answers out there. Although, fortunately, if there are, we know that we can find them at investmentresearchdynamics.com. Dave, could you just let uh, folks know about your site and where they can find you there if they'd like to get access to some of the things you cover? Sure. Um, website's investmentresearchdynamics.com. And on the front page there are links to my mining stock journal and short sellers journal newsletters, which now offer another form of payment besides PayPal. And um, those links explain what's what's involved with the newsletters and the costs and everything. And you also have your blog there with who actually dictates the Fed monetary policy. So a lot of things you're covering and do a great job with the Mining Stock Journal and the Short Sellers Journal and just providing some light onto what's going on in these markets. So great to catch up with you again. Have appreciated your reports you're doing every other week and we'll look forward to seeing you again in two weeks, my friend. Thanks, Chris. Well, thank you to Dave. Sure appreciate that as always. Great to catch up with him, get his insight into what is going on in these markets with gold and silver and some of the interesting events that are happening in the currency markets. So I hope you found that helpful at home. Before we wrap up, I would like to thank Silver Viper who brought us today's video. And recently I talked with Steve Cope about their maiden resource estimate they released. And for a couple quick comments on what he's looking at there, well, here is Steve. You've got a grade here that, you know, in the inferred at El Ruby of 0.9 and the indicated of almost 0.8. The average open pit heap leach mine in this state operates at about 0.5 grams gold average grade and has most of them have very little byproduct. Here we have a half gram gold average grade of silver on top of what's already 0.8, 0.9 gold. And we've shown from our metallurgy that that silver can be recovered, the low grade silver at, you know, 80%. Or close to so again that's going to be an important component that's going to add a lot of additional um grade and economics to a starter pit here but like i said the average mine starts about a half million ounces gold we're already on equivalent basis here around seven hundred thousand gold equivalent ounces or 49 million silver so we're off to a really good start but since that resource we've expanded it um, off the south to the southern end of the Royal on our Ruby by another 300 meters. So again, you're going to fill in drilling since 2021 and filled it in, add ounces there. I think we're going to be able to expand El Ruby at depth, start to develop an underground resource on that, as well as continuing to expand it along strike both to the north and the south. Well, thank you, Steve. Great to see that things are coming along. And thank you to everyone at home for watching. Find out more about Silver Viper at silverviperminerals.com. And we will see you tomorrow with Rafi's Weekly Silver Report.